Good morning and welcome to Advent Food for Thought. It's December the 4th. It's hard to believe, Friday already. And uh, we're here together to, to have a devotion about Advent. And um, when we think about the gift of Christmas and the hope that's been given to us by God through the person and work of our Lord Jesus Christ, you know, I think we can truly stop and, um, and we can give God thanks for all that he's done. To think that God would step out of heaven and come down to us when we're such a band of rebels, it's just amazing. I mean, you look at the scripture in Philippians chapter 2 where it talks about Jesus humbling himself and becoming to, obedient to death on the cross. To think that he would do that for rebels like us, it's quite astounding. And, um, you know, as sinners, we, we reap what we sow. And there's many things, and if you look at your life, I look at my life, there's many things that we could have done differently. And uh, we wish sometimes we could undo the past. But uh, God <laughs> looks at us with mercy. And when we ask Him to forgive us of our sins, he gives us His grace and His mercy even though we don't deserve it. God brought us to the point where we were broken and understood our need for Him. And for some of us it took quite some time before we got to that point where we could see clearly that God had made a way for us to be forgiven and to be set free. Now Israel, in some sense, is a reflection of the human heart and the condition of the human heart. And given multiple chances we see in the scriptures, um, God offered his grace to the people of Israel. He invited them to live for him. But they were a rebellious lot that continually drifted away to their own wicked behaviors. But God, we see, is rich in mercy and, and He's patient and He's abounding in love. He permitted them to, to be disciplined and rather harshly to purge them of their propensity to, to wander. But they ultimately needed grace that only He could provide them. They needed a Savior. And God foreknew and, and, and sent them just the right solution at, at just the right time. And the prophet Isaiah foretells the coming of the Savior, the Messiah. Even in the peak of Israel's rebellion, God, God said to them in Isaiah chapter 40, 2 to 4, Speak tenderly to Jerusalem and proclaim to her that her hard service has been completed that her sin has been paid for, that she has received from the Lord's hand double for all of her sins. A voice of one calling in the wilderness, prepare the way for the Lord, make straight in the desert a highway for our God. Every valley shall be raised up, every mountain and hill be made low, the rough ground shall become level, the rugged places a plain. Like the prophet Isaiah, the prophet Malachi continued in the same thought process when he spoke to Israel on God's behalf. Malachi 3.3 says, I will send my messenger who will prepare the way before me. Then suddenly the Lord you are seeking will come to his temple. The messenger of the covenant whom you desire will come, says the Lord Almighty. Hundreds of years went past when Israel suddenly saw the appearance of a man whose name was John the Baptist. And there was an immediate connection made with the prophet of Isaiah who had talked of a messenger that would come ahead of the Lord. A voice of one calling in the wilderness who God would send to prepare the way for the coming of the promised Messiah. John's role was to prepare the people for the coming 
of the Lord. He did this through telling people to repent, for the kingdom of heaven was near. And, and baptism, the baptism of John, was, was a Jewish ritual, and people were totally immersed in water to, to s symbolize a cleansing of the heart. John's baptism was a symbol of an earnest desire to repent and be cleaned by the living God. John was the second Elijah. He dressed and acted almost like Elijah did. He uh, ate locusts and wild honey and he had clothes of camel's hair and he had a belt tied around his waist and he spent his time in the wilderness. John was a forerunner of the Messiah. He said, I baptize you with water for repentance. But one who, more power, who is more powerful than I is coming after me. I am not worthy to carry his sandals. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and fire. When Jesus walked towards John, who was baptizing these people in the Jordan River, under the influence of the Holy Spirit, John exclaimed, Look, the Lamb of God! who takes away the sin of the world. This is the one whom I meant when I said, a man who comes after me has surpassed me because he was before me. I myself did not know him, but the reason I came baptizing with water was that he might be revealed to Israel. And Jesus became the fulfillment, not only of Isaiah's prophecy, but of Malachi's prophecy, which stated, suddenly the Lord you are seeking will come to his temple. The messenger of the covenant whom you desire will come, says the Lord Almighty. Through the New Testament gospel accounts, we see that Jesus of Nazareth, after he had uh, been performing miracles, he came to Jerusalem. He entered the city of Jerusalem being hailed as the son of David, the one who came, who was coming in the name of the Lord. And Jesus entered the temple in Jerusalem. And when he was there, he confronted the corruption that he saw taking place. And Malachi's prophecy calls him the Lord and says that he is entering his own temple, which is indicative that the Lord of whom he speaks is none other than God himself in the flesh because the temple that he enters belongs to him. We see that Jesus brings the people of Israel and the world a message of a new covenant, where God himself takes the temple, which it did, up to this point had been external, and he makes a new covenant with his own blood and moves into the spirits of human beings whereby those who believe in him become a temple that is not made by the hands of men, a temple of the Holy Spirit. The work of Jesus on Calvary accomplished this. Now when Jesus was speaking, if you remember in the, in the Gospels, in John chapter 4, Jesus had been speaking with a Samaritan woman, and she had been talking to him, about the conflict that had been taking place between the Samaritans and the Jews as to where God would be worshipped. And it's written in the fourth book of John, or fourth chapter of John. She says, Sir, I see that you are a prophet. Our ancestors worshipped on this mountain. But you say that the place where the people must worship is in Jerusalem. Jesus said to her, Woman, believe me, the hour is coming when you will worship the Father neither on this mountain nor in Jerusalem. You worship what you do not know. We worship what we know, for salvation is of the Jews. But the hour is coming and is now here, where the true, when the true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and in truth. For the Father seeks such as these to worship Him. God is spirit, and those who worship Him must worship in spirit, and in truth. The woman said to him, I know the Messiah is coming, who is called the Christ. When he comes, he will proclaim all things to us. And Jesus said to her, 
I am He, the one who is speaking to you. Aren't you glad that Jesus Christ came, He was heralded, He came to set the captives free. He came to establish a new covenant, a new temple in the hearts of His believers.